Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about large scale universal speech generative model. Yeah, so uh, Matt has already covered some of that. And I'm now a research scientist and also leading the audio generation team at Meta. So now my focus is more like on generation for both like speech and music and sound effects. So uh, before that, I also did a bit of like model model speech understanding, like audio visual uh, self supervising or recognition or speaker verification. And before that was like large scale speech pretending like Huber down to back or robust wave to back. And here are just like some of the work uh, I want to highlight from Pat. So I think some of you have seen this before. Do you speak it with your kids? Yes, and my parents. Yeah, so this is like the English to Hokkien translation, where the challenge is that like Hokkien is a language which is mostly spoken. I also speak like Hokkien or like we call Taiwanese. So what we did was like just to use Huber units to replace like the writing system and train the speech to unit model. And we also have like this uh, audiovisual speech enhancement work where we leverage like a pre-trained model to fine tune on real data, which is very small, just like 2.2 hour. And you can hear the original audio without visual, you won't be able to discern like the target speaker or like the source speaker because like the target speaker is actually quieter, like this one. Um, how about you, how about yourself? So like the, how about, how about you, how about yourself? Uh, is like the one who is wearing like this glass recording. So we are trying to hear like the people who talk like more like remotely to the glass. So like the voice is like lower. So with like the help of visual information, we can enhance like the target speaker like this one. Very cool. What do you, where do you drive? Right, so like based on like the lip information, it will be able to locate or like determine what is the target speaker here. So also all the work um, include like Huber and voice, it, voice box is what I'm going to mainly introduce today. Okay, so let's get started on the introduction part. Cool. So uh, I want to start this talk with like introducing, or like, I guess most of you have already known, like the breakthrough in all the areas. So we see like recently there has a lot of breakthrough in large scale image and text generative models. So on the left, we have like a model from Google called Party. So it pretty much just like tokenizes the image and treat that as a sick to sick model from text description to image tokens. And by leveraging the VQVAE the tokenizer, it can then convert the image back from token to like pixels. And on the right, we have like the diagram for Llama 2 or like pretty much like the diagram for most of the large language model nowadays. So you have like large scale data, which you use to pretend and you have like some curated data which you fine tune and like train a reward model on. So the model would conform to certain formats of the response, response like a uh, assistant type. And it will also like have like some value function which guide the model to not answer certain type of questions when it's not appropriate or like align to like more acceptable values. Because like on the internet, there's a lot of trolls. Okay, so what's like amazing from this kind of model is like, it is more than performing just like a single task. Like, What's amazing about this is like, it has a very uh, strong generalization capabilities. So what they do is like, they try to find a parent task, which is like powerful enough. It can subsume all kind of like tasks we want to consider for that domain. So for kind of like large language model, what we show here is just like a table from a paper, which shows like with a large language model, how, can, how you can prompt engineer, uh, how you can engineer your prompt to make the model to perform different tasks like text classification, sentiment analysis, topic classification, or text bank classification, or even do generation generative tasks like summarization or paraphrasing. And similarly, I think like the generalization capability for text to image model is like, you can train on all kinds of like text image pairs. So the model will learn what's the concept of a desert, what's the concept of sunglasses, and what's the concept of a cactus, right? And most likely they're not, like uh, it won't be able to, it won't see like such an image of like a small cactus wearing a straw hat and near some glasses, right? So it just like learn what these com uh, concepts are and it will be able to have some emerging capability to have like this compositionality, like ability to create like new images. So like generalization is what we're going for here. So one of the key to uh, make all this work is scaling. So scaling has two aspects. 
One is the data and the other is the model. So we see on the left, like these are snipp snippets from like a party model. You see like they train on, I think the same data, but like with different model parameters from three 15 million parameters, like a large transformer model, like 24 layers, roughly this size, to like 20 billion uh, parameter models. You probably cannot see very clearly like on, the, on like the, the screen here, but what we want to highlight is like on the smallest model, you see a kangaroo holding a sign, writing some text, but like the kangaroo does not really look right. And the text there does not re reflect like what's being provided as the input prompt. And but like on the right, you see like everything is being captured like very nicely. You have the nice sunglass, you have a very like realistic kangaroo, and you also have the sign saying welcome friends, right? So all these are like, we see like with the same data, scaling plays a role here. And on the right, it's like a, like the table, uh, the chart from like the OpenAI ChatGPT4 technical reports. So it shows like uh, the vertical axis is like the perplexity for predicting like the next token. So word pieces here. And the X axis is like the corporate size. So you see like with increasing amount of data, you can get like the next word prediction more and more accurate. So like this like summarizes like with scaling by both like scaling data and scaling model, we'll see more and more like emerging capability and much stronger like model than ever. I mean, what's the x-axis on that plot? I seem confused. Okay, yeah. So I guess like, okay, I might have put it wrong. So like it's compute, but like there are also all the scaling low paper for like data size. So I guess like compute, like number of updates and like uh, data size are also like factors here. Yeah. Sorry for, thanks for the correction. Yeah. So uh, come back to speech. So we have already, we have also seen like uh, speech has like seen a lot of like benefit like by scaling, right? So like here, I just like list a few works here. So on top, we have like the MMS work uh, from Meta. So it's like we scale to like, it's not super big. It's just like 45,000 hours of data from, but like the point here is like it scales to 1,100 languages for like the label data. So we use it to train like speech recognition model and like text to speech synthesis model, also like language identification model. And we can also like scale to increase like the language coverage with more like unlabeled data. So here, I think like the biggest model we have coverage for is like about like 4,000 languages in total. And we also see like scaling plays an important role for like Google's uh, USN. So it's like speech recognition beyond 100 languages. They show they effectively scale to 12 million hours of unlabeled audio and fine tune that with like 200, thousand hours of uh, labeled audio. And likewise, we have like several other works like Simless M4T uh, released this about like two months ago and Whisper, which trends on like 680,000 hours of labeled audio. So we see like scaling like improves like the robustness and generalization to different domains here. But like all the models I've talked about are mainly like a discriminative model, like which mostly tackle the many to one mapping problem. This kind of like scaling is not so often done for speech generative models. So if you think about like the traditional speech generative tasks, like text to speech synthesis or voice conversion, emotion conversion, they usually train like on small like toy data sets. So like take text to speech generation, for example, we see like the earlier work like Techotron 1.2, Fast Speech 1.2. Uh, more recently we have like WaveGrad 2, Flowtron or Guided TTS. And in the paper, you see most of this work are trained on like LJ speech, which is a single speaker, 24 hour audiobook reading data set. Or like if people want to tackle like multi speaker, they will train on like VCTK. So it's like 109 speakers in total 40 hours. Or like more recently, people start using like Liberty TTS, the clean partition, which in total has about like 1,151 speakers, uh, amounts to about like 250 hours. Or like some model, like some company also trains on proprietary data. But compared to the scale we have been using for like speech recognition, like it's relatively scale and restricted domain. So we gotta ask ourselves like this question, which is like, what stops us from like scaling the speech generative model? Like, do we not want to scale the speech generative model? Like we can imagine we have like better coverage on the domain or generate more diverse speech by doing that. But like, why haven't people done that until very recently? So first question is like, do we have enough data to scale? So I would say yes, because like I've shown in the previous slide, like ASR model or all the speech recognition understanding model have been using more than the data we use for speech generation. And the next question is like, okay, if it's not the data, then is it about like the compute? 
So the question is like, yes, we also have enough compute. So like most of the TTS model are like smaller, like 100 million parameters at most. Uh, but ASA model have been trained like on much bigger like data, like 24 layer, 48 layers, up to like 2 billion or even more, right? Like a USM is like 2 billion. So it's not a matter of like, we don't have compute or we cannot like scale the model size. So the next question is like, okay, if compute and the data are not the issue, then can we just like say use Tacrotron 2 or FastBeach 2, increase the model size, throw the data in and hope like it's going to generalize like magically to in a wild data. Okay, so my answer to this question is like, no, no. So the reason is like, they do not model the right family of distribution. So I will cover like very soon next. So it's about underfitting, but the underfitting is not about like the model number of parameters. It's about like the underlying statistical assumption you make like to the distribution you are modeling here. So, okay, the next part is going to be why prior models do not scale. Okay, so the so bottom line here side. Yeah. You're saying you tried scaling them and in fact they don't scale. Yeah, we tried them and like we had some work trying to use like noisy data, like common voice, like even noisy data, you were just general, I will have some samples later. You were general, general like average noise, which is not realistic noise. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, I would say like the key caveat of this model is like they often trend with just like regression loss, like L2 loss or a mix of like L2 and L1 loss. So on the right, we show like speech generation. If you consider like real in the wild data, it's like the product of many different factors all put together. You have like variation in content, which is like the most straightforward to model. You also have like variation in speaker, which you can probably get away with like using speaker lookup table or like speaker embedder. But you also have like other aspects like emotion, like prosody, or even like if you have recording with different microphones with like different like backgrounds, then you will have all sort of like noise in that, right? So in a sense, like it's a one to many problem. And like, we should think about like what we model as a distribution, not like a point estimate of like one to one mapping. So the models, like the two specific models I mentioned just now, like fast, fast speech two and like a uh, tackle chunk two, they are minimizing like a regression loss. So you predict like a continuous feature, like mouse spectrogram, and you compute like the difference between like the prediction and like the reference, minimizing L2 loss. So what minimizing L2 loss effectively translates to is you assume the conditional distribution given all the inputs is a Gaussian distribution with an isotropic variance. So you are minimizing a O2 loss, which you assume like there's a diagonal covariance matrix with like some scalar value for like the variance you can scale up or down. It's just like a scaling factor for like the, which would translate to learning rate, doesn't really matter. So you assume like you are modeling a Gaussian distribution while in fact, like the underlying distribution can be extremely like multi-model non-Gaussian. So what you will end up is like, we have like a figure on the bottom right here. So just imagine, sorry, you have like a mixture distribution of two modes and now you are trying to fit in Gaussian distribution, then what you end up is like, just like the curve you fit there. Like it's going to predict like the mean of these two modes. It's not going to be any one of those modes. And like then if you sample around that, you will not get like a realistic output. And this is also a lot of the time you see when you train auto, auto encoder, like version auto encoder, you tend to see like blurry input. Cause like that's just like the average of all the possible modes there. So it's very strong assumption and like it's unrealistic in most cases, especially when there's more and more unspecified variation like between input and output. So coming back like to the problem of like scaling number of layers, scaling parameters, like it doesn't really solve the problem because like the neural network you're using here is just like an estimator which you use to estimate the mean, right? So you still impose the same underlying statistical assumption, which is Gaussian. So you can estimate the mean more precisely but then you are still not modeling a distribution, right? And you cannot like easily simple, realistic, like that very simple from such distribution. So it um, underfits regardless of like how many parameters you have. And you can add auxiliary loss to maybe like change where you are predicting the mean. For example, you might add like an adversarial loss like GAN. So in that case, maybe you'll move your prediction to one of the mode because like GAN will penalize if you generate like unrealistic input, right? But like it will still cover just one of the modes. You cannot cover both modes with this like prediction output. Okay, so we have like some case study here. Uh, this is not exactly like, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I, I just want to make sure I understand how the loss works. So it's looking globally at the spectrogram 
uh, like over uh, you know ten second uh, re response or a ten second generation. So for fast speech to like uh, what it does like is you predict uh, you predict say eighty dimensional male spectrogram, right? Yeah. You have like say if it's ten seconds, one hundred hertz, then you have like a uh, uh, like eight hundred frames, right? So you just like compute the L two loss like per every time uh, frequency beam. Every time, sorry. For every time frequency beam, you compute like, a, it's kind of like the L2 loss between two images. Yeah, and so is the structure of the model still sequential? So each frame uh, is being generated conditioned on all the previous frames? Right, that's a good question. So uh, that's why at least like fast speech 2 and uh, Tacrotron. So for fast speech 2, like it's not conditioned on previous frame. You condition on text and also like force alignment or some F0 features. So all the frames are predicted like simultaneously. Yeah, okay. And, and then you also- Within a frame also predicted simultaneously. Yeah, simultaneously. so for Tacrotron 2, it's like frame by frame, but within the frame, like the 80 dimensional feature yeah. is still predicted like simultaneously. So each frequency is like conditionally, uh, conditionally independent. Right, so that's even worse. Uh, like being jointly Gaussian would still be a problem, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but like it's even worse because like each of like the beam like you're predicting are there. So there are like some work which you can like, try to do like pixel CN is one of the work. You predict one pixel at a time, right? So it's kind of like alleviates the like the conditional independence assumption yeah. between bin, but you still have to assume some distribution like you're modeling for each bin, yeah. Thanks. Cool. So uh, like here's like some case study for a model called like Hypergain. So Hypergain is just like a model which was typically used for uh, vocoding. So it tries to convert like a male spectrogram into waveform, but then like the loss it imposes is like, once you have the waveform, you can compute like the frequency, like a feature, like it's differentiable, it's just like change of basis. And you can remask like L2 loss on those frequency. And you also have some adversarial loss directly computed on different segments of the waveform. So it's fit into like the category I just described, which is a regression plus gain loss. So now we do a simple example here where we train the model on the asset called Expresso. So Expresso is a multi-speaker data set with like a different emotions. So overall, like it has like text variation, speaker variation, and emotion variation there. So here's one example of like a speaker speaking in like a whispered emotion. What room has no walls? A mushroom. So a very boring joke. What room does not have a wall? A mushroom. So, okay. So we turn two models here. One is like we condition this model um, all the variation we assume like we can specify. The text variation, to be precise, it's specified with like Huber self-supervised only. And then like uh, the speaker like ID and also the emotion ID. So with that, like we can regenerate like this audio pretty accurately. What room has no walls? A mushroom. Right. So we then train another model which has like unspecified variation. So we only provide like text and speaker inputs and then we synthesize that. So here's the output. What room has no walls? A mushroom. So it's kind of like an average in the sense of like, when the model sees that speaker, sometimes like it's speaking in a normal tone, sometimes like it's speaking in a whispering tone, sometimes like happy, it's sad, right? So it just like get confused, like when to predict what. So it can only select one kind of the output. So in the end, it's just like a mix of like, sometimes it's whispering, sometimes like it's voiced. So we see like this kind of problem would also translate to other model, like produce like overly smooth, like tone, like prosody or like uh, background noise. So um, one way people try to do to avoid underfitting is try to work on the data to make the probabilistic assumption fits the data better. So we can use like cleaner data, more monotonic data to train the model. So like the mapping become like more like one-to-one -one. And like the model won't overfit, like underfits that that valley, or you can just like provide as much conditioning information as possible just to simplify the mapping. But like they are probably they are all like using the same techniques. You are not really solving the problem of like your model cannot uh, trend to generate like unspecified variation here. Okay, cool. So uh, the next part is like okay, uh, definitely like I'm not the first to notice that right. Like there are prior work which tries to tackle this problem. So one way you can tackle the problem is by introducing a Latin variable. So you assume like there's some like unobserved variation, like not given by your input. So you want to jointly learn like a space which capture this variation, right? So 
what you can do is like we show like a diagram on the right here. So for a typical TTS model, you can assume you have like hat, which is provided as the input. You have some class, some attribute, which is observed like speaker label, which you have, but then you have like some Latin variables here, which are not seen. So you are trying to optimize like the likelihood of like this probability uh, by like taking into account this Latin variable. So this is usually done in the versional autoencoder framework where you marginalize, you, you compute a lower bound where you marginalize overly observed latent. So this lower, this latent is usually like a low dimension variable where you can just like easily sample from. And you also assume a prior on that, like Gaussian, right? So then like uh, we see like now we are modeling a distribution where we assume probability of the speech, even the text and other observed variable and this Latin variable is Gaussian. So it's better than the previous one because like the previous one assume without like this latent when you marginalize over that is Gaussian. But now when you introduce this latent, you sort of like give it like more freedom to model like more multi-model distribution. But like there are some caveats of like this framework as in like if you have worked on version of encoder, you would know like uh, it suffers from the problem where like if you increase like the latent dimension too much, then actually some of the dimension would just be like that dimension. They are not just like encoding any information. Or like, for example, like if you employ an autoencoder framework where like the posterior of this latent is inferred from the output data itself, then you might risk some like data leakage where like the data is encoding also, like this latent would be also encoding information about the text you try to control here. So in summary, like there are some constraints for this latent where it has to be like low dimension. So it is useful for kind of like characterizing uh, some variation which you think you can model in low dimensional space like prosody, like happy or sad, right? Like that's kind of like slider tweak around like the average pitch. But like, if you again, like want to model like more in the wild variation, like different kind of background noise. So here's an example from the global style token from Google. So it has like different memories, like which is supposed to correspond to different mode of the audio. And you see like for some of the memory token you condition, it can generate like clean speech. The avocado is a pear shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh and a large stone. So I should note that like this model is trained on mix of like clean speech and speech at, with, added with reverberation or different kind of noise. So for some of the token, they claim to correspond to reverb. Like the reverb token sounds like this. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. And music token. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin. Yep, so it's a bit like loud, but overall you get my idea. Like it's like you generate like music, right? You can hear some notes there, right? But like it's not really like the very realistic noise of like music. If you hear music in the background, it most likely would be not like this, right? So it just like, still have the limited capacity of generating any kind of like, like data you might see in the training set. Okay, so this is just like a quick recap of what just what I just mentioned. So we have like these two families of the model, which is like regression or regression with low dimensional latent. So we have like some models, fast speech, tachotron, or like global style token, uh, version of encoder variants of the tachotron. So the capability of like the left one is like the most limited. It assumes a deterministic mapping. On the right, it assumes there are some unspecified variation in low dimension space, condition which is still a regression task. So therefore like on the left, we just see like they train on simple data sets like LJ speech, BCTK, where all the variations are specified. And on the right, we can stretch that a bit more. Like we can train it on like Blizzard where it has like the prosody variation or train on the TTS where there's more like noise variation and speaker variation in it. Okay, so uh, just quick overview on like several other alternatives like to go beyond what I just mentioned. So there are two family of model which can do better than the one I just mentioned. One is like GAN and the other is Flow. So again, like uh, just very briefly for people who have worked on that probably know like uh, it also is very prone to mode collapsing. So it can generate like realistic output, but a lot of the time it doesn't really cover all the modes like in the data. As in like people have tried to do like comparing that with a simple Gaussian mixture model and found like Gaussian mixture model would simply do a much better job on mode coverage at the cost of like having more blurry inputs. And flow is another thing which is more related to what I'm going to cover next. So flow is based on is a maximum likelihood estimator and it's based on change of variables. So the idea is very simple. You have the data distribution you want to model and you have a prior distribution where you think like you can compute uh, like the likelihood easily and you can also draw samples from very easily. So the model is not directly trying to fit a parametric distribution of the data. 
it is trying to learn the transformation, like gradually convert from data to noise and noise to data. So in summary, like it is learning a bijective mapping between these two. So when you train a model, you just like convert the data into the noise space. And you can estimate based on this tra trajectory of transformation and like the likelihood in the noise space, what's the likelihood of that data in the space, right? So you can still train a model with the maximum likelihood estimator. And on the other hand, when you want to draw samples, you do the reverse thing where you draw a sample from the noise and you do the inverse mapping from noise to data. So you get a sample. So uh, it's very powerful. And as you approach like the in infinite number of like transformation you do in between, then you can theoretically approximate like any functions. But then like there are some restrictions on this kind of model. So as I mentioned, like the mapping has to be bijective. So it's not like any mapping you train with like any initialization of the model will be bijective. So they need to deploy a certain kind of like decomposition about the transformation where like uh, it has to make sure like it has a full rank and the Jacobian matrix can be computed like easily for you to train a model because you have to estimate the determinant of the matrix when you like uh, locally expand or contract the distribution. So in short, like uh, this has shown some promising results, but like the design space for this is more li limited. So there are like some better models which we'll have cover next, which can solve this problem. So, okay, how do we get away from autofitting? So I would say like nowadays, like there are two major camp of approaches here. One is token-based approach. This is very simple. You just like quantize, you just like discretize the space. So as the number of bins like approaches like infinity, you can just like uh, model any kind of distribution or you can approximate any distribution up to really well, right? So this is what people typically do for text because like text is discrete, so it's natural. But you can also do that for image, which is like the party model I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Or there's also like Microsoft has a model called like Volley, which also use say, uh, Incodec or Soundstream model to tokenize speech. And then like you just train the language model on those tokens. So this is one kind of approach. And I would say the downside is like, it does require a tokenizer and the tokenizer pair. So your performance is pretty much bounded by the tokenizer, the tokenizer you use. Cause like there will be information loss like in this process. Right? And also like the language model approach also discards the notion of uh, distance here. Because like when you map things to token, everything is just like equally distance. Of course, you can compute in embedding space, but that, that's just like another layer of work. So a second line of approach is a uh, gradient-based approach. So the one I just mentioned, like flow, discrete flow, can be considered as that because like it's uh, modeling like a transformation between two distributions. And more famously known approaches nowadays are diffusion models. So diffusion model is is like doing exactly the same thing. So it is also like you sample from an initial noise and then you gradually transform like to the data distribution. But like the training of like such model is efficient because you are not really explicitly estimating the likelihood of the data. Instead, like default, you can just like estimate the score function, which is the gradients in the data space. And you have your model directly predicting that. And you can also derive like the target of that. So you directly sample like the random points in this transformation find the gradients you want to predict and train your model to predict that. So that's more efficient to train. And again, like it can also approximate any, any distribution. So to visualize like what this kind of model really learns is like this one. So on the bottom right, we see a data of like, you can think of like two Gaussian, right? Like one has like higher weights on the upper right. Uh, one has lower weights on the upper left. So if you compute like the derivatives in that space, then you will have like this like vector fields which shows like from which, like at this point, going toward which direction you'll increase like the probability density like of the, of the distribution. So this is the score function they are modeling. So here, just like visualize on the bottom left, we have visualization of like, you have a two mode distribution and you go through some like sto sto stochastic process and which would brings you to this prior distribution. And then what the model is trying to learn is like from this prior distribution back to their distribution. What is like the score function here? Okay, it's a lot of math, but uh, just like grasp the high level, high level concept is not. So now like to classify like the popular generative model nowadays in different areas. So we see in text, like all of them are doing like token-based. There are some attempts trying like gradient-based in the embedding space, but like I don't see any of them like showing promising results because like token is just like a natural choice for text. For image, we see more like options here. So we have like party or chameleon, like based on CM3, like it's like token-based approach. 
they show promising results. But I would say like uh, more recent work, like all fall into this like a gradient based method. So you have the option of like whether you're doing diffusion directly in the pixel space, or you can also learn like an autoencoder like VAE to learn some like more compact latent space and do diffusion in the latent space. So you also have like options to pick from here. So similarly for non-speech audio, we have like audio gen and music gen from Meta, which also trains like a language model on audio tokens. Or you also have like noise to music audio of DM and Tango, which does diffusion for audio. So today, like we focus on speech. So for speech, token-based methods are like Bali from Microsoft, Sphere TTS or Sound, sorry, this should be like Soundstorm from Google. So they just like train a two-stage like language model where which converts from say text to something like Huber tokens or wave to back tokens. And then from wave to back tokens to acoustic tokens that whose mapping back to audio can be assumed like more deterministically. And on the right, we have like natural speech too, again from Microsoft, which does the diffusion in Latin, Latin space and our model uh, voice box, which uh, works on raw feature, but we have also tested on infotech feature, which also works. And I'll explain like, this model is based on a latest uh, generative model called flow matching. Uh, it's similar to diffusion, but slightly different and it can be trained and run inference line more efficiently. Okay. So here are all the introduction part. So in the next part, I'm going to talk about like voice box, uh, which is our recent work on large scale speech generation and to make it more uh, versatile. So this is like a summary of like voice box. So the goal we want to do with voice box is first, we want to build a single model that can subsume many tasks. So we want to go more toward like the generalist model direction where a single model can solve like say denoising, speech generation, uh, random voice sample generation, voice conversion, emotion conversion. And then like uh, the second goal is like, we want to tackle the problem we mentioned earlier, which is like, we want to choose the right modeling approach to train our model so it can scale to bigger architecture and more data. So the method we take here is like, instead of like doing just like a text to speech synthesis task, we're going to formulate a task called like transcript guided in feeling, uh, which I'll talk more. And the model we're going to use is a uh, co flow matching with optimal transport. Okay, so let's get into each of those. Okay, so the first is going to tackle this goal and using this method. So what I mean by uh, transcript, transcript guided in filling is you can see on the right here. So typically when we do TTS, it's like we have tags, we just like generate the entire speech. So instead of like generating the entire speech, what we do here is more like a cl close, uh, like BERT, which we do audio closing. So we're provided with the transcript of the entire audio. We have the audio, we just like randomly mask a chunk. It can be a small chunk, it can be a large chunk. It can even be the entire audio. And then the task of the model is to given the transcript and given the audio context, trying to infill the audio. So that's what we call like test guided infilling. So this is sort of like the generalization of next token prediction, because like, because it's non autoregressive you can also see not only the past context, but also the future context. Yeah. So, good question. Yeah. Uh, just a, a comment, not not for you, but more for the for the students here. The, this is uh, a good idea, partly because it removes the need for a latent variable in something like the AE uh, or uh, labeling things like emotion or speech style. Those are just extractable from the context. Right. Exactly. So the idea. Anything that's global. Uh, exactly. Which might include things like emotional balance or speech rate um, or accent. Yeah. Um, the idea is like the audio context, like there are some global attributes which which tends to be coherent within the audio. So instead of like directly specifying that, we can at least like pretend the model with its test, right? So the model would know like it's kind of like prompt engineering, but in the audio domain, which just in context in filling. Where like when you crop out an audio and you infill, most likely they're not like the surrounding audio, which should be from the same speaker, recorded in the same environment with the same amount of reverberation and in the same motion as the context. So you can use it to just like infill any audio or to create new audio, as long as you have a template or like an example of the specific speaker emotion environment you want to generate. Right. So, so that, that, that would yeah. even help if you were doing still doing L2, although you're doing something smarter. Right, you're doing L2, but like L2, which is kind of like produce an average thing. But like now we want to, like this is a task, but what model we use to model distribution is a separate task. Yeah, cool. 
So yeah, so uh, we train the model to infill, which I will explain like what kind of tasks can be covered, although I already described some of those, like in the next slide. And so to break that down, uh, what we do here is we have two modules. So we adopt like an autoaggressive architecture. So similar to FastPitch 2, we will first have like the phoneme and like the context for duration. So this is obtained by force alignment. So given like the duration context and the phony, we will predict like the duration of like the phoning we want to infill, which we don't have the audio for. And once we have like this force alignment, and then we're going to condition our force aligned phonemes and the audio context, and just to train a model to predict, to model the distrib distribution of like this missing audio from the context. Okay, so, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, in that picture, like implicitly there is a, constraint on the sum of all the durations that you're predicting because you implicitly know the length of the mask segment. But you're not going to impose that explicitly, right? Uh, so like the first step is like, you don't really know, you don't really need to know the length of the part which you want to infill. Yeah, no, but you're going to backdrop from the masks and you know the length uh, of the mask. So, so yeah, it, but you're not going to impose it. The model will do what it does. Right, right. And these two are like to be precise, like training separately. So we have an audio model which we, is trained with like the ground truth force alignment and really mask audio. Oh, you yeah, them separately. yeah, we're training separately. But definitely, we can make it like end to end, like but. Okay, no, no, I'm just asking the mechanics. But okay, no, I, I think it's fine. And also, I assume that in that uh, row of sample duration, that three in the upper line is a mistake. That it's a known variable of the number, so you shouldn't change it. So like, go right. to the left. On the left, yeah. So one, two, three, yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. Uh -huh. But three doesn't agree with the four below. Uh, so that's just an error in your slide, right? Or yeah, so of... that's actually, uh, it's more like a detailed thing. So it's like we put this as input and we predict the output, but like the output does not always agree with the input, oh, no. but it doesn't really that's matter, it, right? Like, you didn't answer yeah. my question. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily follow. Okay. No, yeah. But you. we're just going to take like the predicted part for the mask and like yeah. use like the ground truth here because we have the ground truth. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, next, I'm going to dis dis like discuss like why this task can subsume a lot of tasks of interest. So the first is like uh, we can use it as a speech editor or a speech denoiser. So the pipeline is as follows: Say we have an original audio of like "Hello World," and then we want to change it to uh, "Hello Tom." Right. So we want to edit this like word into Tom. So what we do is just like similar to what we do for training. We find like where the audio of Tom corresponds to. We mask that and we ignore the duration of that. We just like then force align and replace that. So now you see the transcript here become like, uh, hello, Tom. And we also have like duration for silence. So this is technical detail. And we put them as like zero. So we're going to predict, okay, for T, R, M, we're going to be having like one, five, two frames. So we just like inject the corresponding number of frames and like modify like the transcript correspondingly. And we can then like predict what's the Tom to be in field, right? It can be different Tom, 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 right? So it's going to be a journalistic modeling approach. And similarly, why we say like it can be also used for tr removing transient noise is like, this is if you have used like magic eraser or if you have used, I don't know, like uh, Adobe's generated in field, then you will know this feature where like, suppose like, let's think about image. Like suppose like we have like an auditorium here, right? Like and like I'm standing here, you take a photo of myself. And then if I, you want to erase me from like this picture, then what you're going to do is like, you're going to crop me out entirely. And based on like this surrounding image, then you are going to infill this part. Because most of the time you will see auditorium without person in that, maybe that's not a good analogy, but you get the idea. You will just like infill the context and will just like sample from the prior distribution. Most likely it's going to not have a people, but sometimes it do. So you can just like generate multiple samples and find one which decide people in that. So you can apply the same idea for denoising as well. So if I'm speaking, uh, good morning, everyone, welcome to the class. But like when I say like, welcome, like suddenly like there's a dog barking, just like for that short segment. And what I can do is like, I can entirely erase that segment and then try to regenerate like that word. And because like the context is like clean with all this like dog barking noise, so the model would likely to infill the audio without dog barking noise. So this is kind of the audio version of the magic eraser you can use. And then like, again, you can also use it for zero shot text to speech synthesis where you clone a specific voice, emotion and environments. So the idea again is simple. So it's sort of like 
trick the model to make it assume like you are generating two sentences, right? And one sentence is masked, right? So you're just going to like to give more specific example. Again, you have like me speaking hello world and also the audio. And you also, again, want to generate like me speaking, hey folks. So I'm just going to concatenate the transcript of hello world and hey folks into one sentence, assuming hey folks is masked. Well, like it doesn't exist from the very beginning, right? So I'm just going to predict the duration of hey folks, given the context of like hello world and the duration of that. Predicting the duration of hey folks, and then again, like concatenate them uh, to form like the force line transcript, and then assume all the audio correspond to hey folks is masked, and then generate that. So in this way, it's more like in context continuation. The model will learn to continue with the same voice, same motion, same environment. So it's like go, it goes beyond just voice cloning. It's like cloning everything in the audio, except for like content, except for content. And finally, because like when we train our model, we also have the case where we entirely mask the entire audio. So we can just like generate something from nothing. So we'll show it can generate like very diverse accent, emotion, prosody, and like a pattern. Yeah. Okay. So um Right, so this is just like an overview of what I just said. So the bottom line is like, we can perform all these tasks with a single model by just like forming the input differently. So this is sort of like forced into the prompt engineering regime for audio model. And then like next, we're going to describe like how we train the model. So the method we adopt is called like flow matching. So flow matching is uh, a family for a family of model called like continuous normalizing flow. So remember I mentioned like the flow, the discrete flow is like you have a prior distribution, you have a data distribution, you assume there are like maybe 10 steps, for example, like for the model to transform from this prior distribution to the uh, data distribution. So you are trying to use like these 10 discrete steps to fit like distribution as well as possible, right? But like continuous flow just like ex extend beyond like the notion of that. You don't have like discrete steps anymore. You assume like the entire transformation is just continuous. So you are modeling the entire thing as an ordinary differential equation. You are modeling like a differential equation, like you are modeling like the, the deriv derivatives at any data point at any time in this space. So you assume the initial timestamp for this transformation is zero, final is one. You train a neural network, which can take as input like the timestamp between like zero and one and the data point there. So it just like shows the gradient at that point. And how you do the like uh, data transformation is you run a OD solver. So there's a lot of like off the shelf OD solver, which allows you to do differential equation, solving the initial value problem, given the derivatives and the initial value. So it's kind of, again, you still simple from the prior and you have your network, which models like the derivatives, and then you do integration to integrate over the trajectory, which gives the data at the end. So this is continuous normalizing flow. But initially, this uh, this paper is uh, presented in I think twenty nineteen, like near uh, iClear. So comp training of that is like very time consuming because like initially it's using like a maximum likelihood estimation, which means like you need to do this integration every time when you train each sample because like you are trying to find for each data point what's the likelihood in the prior space. So it's very time consuming. So now like uh, this year earlier this year in iClear, like uh, the same co-author, the same author from that paper uh, proposed a new approach called flow matching. So this gets it like much closer to diffusion model, where again, like now we don't need to directly estimate the likelihood of that. We're finding a way to directly find the target of the gradient we're trying to predict here. And the model is directly minimizing the L2 loss with respect to the gradient. So it's like much more efficient for training. And the formulation of that is very similar to diffusion. And in fact, like, we see like there's a flow matching with diffusion and flow matching with optimal transport here. So this is an interesting thing, as in like when you define your prior distribution and when you define your data distribution, there is actually infinite number of ways you can transform from one distribution to the other distribution. So just think about this as like for each data point, you will go through some trajectory like in this transformation and goes into the data space. So this trajectory is what we are training our model to learn. So we are going to assume there are some trajectory the data point follows, and then we train a model to fit the trajectory. So depending on what trajectory you select, you actually would be able to train model 
faster or slower because like some trajectory, if it's like swirl trajectory, it will be very hard for the model to learn. And if it's like a straight line, it's going to be very easy to learn. So there's a huge design space here for you to tell the model, what is the trajectory we are going to pick? So uh, like I already mentioned here, so a simpler trajectory is not only easier for the model to fit, but also like when you do inference, you are doing an integration. And because like this is a continuous space, you are just going to approximate that with some ODs over anyway. So ODs over most likely you will use like first order, midpoint, or like even second order. So the idea here is like, if the trajectory is more like a lower order like uh, function, then you can approximate that more accurately. So you can also run inference like faster. So to put it in a different term, for diffusion model, you know nowadays people usually do like 100, 100 several hundreds of diffusion steps to get to the data point. So it makes it even slower than autoregressive like language model. But think about like if you have a trajectory you, which you can solve the ODE equation like much more efficient with two steps, then you can do inference much faster than autoregressive model. So the authors like of this paper propose like uh, they first found like diffusion model actually just correspond to a specific trajectory in a, in this like continuous normalizing flow. And then they propose a trajectory which is e easier to learn called optimal transports. Like, so we adopt like this optimal transport path to train our model. So does that mean you're trading off of one best path? Um, so it's a bit like harder than that. So what it does is like, it actually shows that like uh, for each data point, it's like a straight line between like the data and the prior. But like what we're trying to learn is like the, the marginal vector field, not the conditional vector field. But they show that like the expected value of this like conditional vector, vector field is the same as the marginal vector field. So when we train the model to optimize that, like eventually you will learn the, mar the marginal, the optimal marginal vector field. So it's not like a uh, one single path because like for the data, it will actually perturb slightly around the data points with a very small variance. So we're making from one distribution to the other distribution. So is there an optimization to solve the transportation problem? Uh, it's, so it's like, uh, how say that? Like, the transportation problem is not what we're trying to solve here. So it defines like a path which amounts to which corresponds to the optimal transport. So it's kind of like this distribution, this like this mapping here, is the optimal transport path for individual data points. So what it tries to do is like for the data distribution, you have like sample from the data distribution, right? For each sample, I will define a trajectory from like that sample to the prior. Right, so all the sample, like eventually they are going to map to the prior. So all the sample, like there's an optimal transport path you can derive between two Gaussian distribution. Like it's analytical it's analytical solution, which is just like a straight line between all the points here, between two Gaussian. So it's kind of like the marginal of like this vector field is like what we're solving here. So, so I don't want to slow you down further. Okay, yeah, we can, we can discuss, discuss more, but like, I think there are more details in the paper, yeah. Cool. So uh, if we put everything together, then this is our model. On the left, we have like the voice box audio model. So uh, systematically what we do during training is like, we'll have like transcript on the bottom, audio in the middle, and we're going to sample a random noise from the prior, and then also sample a random step like in this like flow matching process, like this diffusion process. We're just going to mess the audio randomly and find like the data points, like the noise, like in this like uh, transformation. And then we're going to train the model to predict like the flow, which is the gradient. So uh, it's not like that hard to implement. Like the mathematical formulation is very simple. And like during inference, what we're going to do is like, as I say, we have like the conditioning input, which is like the text and the audio context. And we have the audio model, which parameterizes the derivative. And then we're going to first like draw a sample from the prior and pass like this as a condition to an ODE solver. So bottom line here, like we can decide how many steps we want to use to solve like this differential equation. And depending on like the number of steps we use here, like it will change like the efficiency. So we can configure the runtime efficiency for our model. Okay, so the next section, I'm going to share like some of the results here. So the highlight is like, we show like very versatile like model uh, because you can perform all the tasks I just mentioned. And we also achieve like state of the art performance better than the language model approach uh, from Bali. And also we show like uh, how 
we can trade off like quality and the runtime efficiency. Okay, so this is like the first section of audio I'm going to show. So this is the audio sample where you can hear dog barking in the middle. In zero weather, in midwinter, when the earth is frozen to a great depth below the surface, when then driving over the unpaved country roads, they give forth a hard metallic ring. So we're going to just provide like this as the input to the model. In zero weather, in midwinter, when the earth is frozen. Yeah, so that part is going to be silent, right? So model is now going to see that and model is going to infill that section. So this is the output. In zero weather, in midwinter, when the earth is frozen to a great depth below the surface, when in driving over the unpaved country roads, they give forth a hard metallic ring. So this is like entirely unseen speaker, and this is actually from our colleague because of some restriction, we have to record audio and get the consent ourselves. But anyway, like it learns to infill, uh, in my opinion, like pretty seamlessly, like to the context. So there are more samples on the website. I would encourage you to listen. and. We also have like audio with like people speaking in different accents, but like that's covered in our data. So that's one of the benefits. We really want to train on all kinds of data possible to learn what each accent sounds like, right? And based on the context, we can infer infill with the right accent. Uh, actually, yep. the example that you explained, uh, I didn't understand something about your underlying model. Is it infilling from one side or both sides? From both sides, yeah. Yeah. I, I just didn't finish playing the audio. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, got it. So it give forth a hard yeah. metallic ring. Right, because it's not auto aggressive, so it can right. be any side. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I'll skip the number. Uh it's not so interesting. And we can also do editing. So you can imagine like this is the original audio. Will find himself completely at a loss on occasions of common and constant recurrence. Speculative ability is one thing, and a practical ability is another. Uh, to the edited one. Will find himself completely at a loss on rare and unpredictable circumstances. Speculative ability is one thing and a practical ability is another. So I have to admit like there are some small artifacts in that, but again, I feel like this is something as we train a model on more data and scale, like this should be solvable. Yeah. And then like, this is like the modeling goal, zero shot TTS where just as I mentioned, we concatenate an entirely new sentence and ask a model to continue. So I think this is like a one spoken by my French colleague. A beast to find a place to live. So this is a very short prompt, just like three seconds. And this is the output. And lay me down in thy cold bed and leave my shining lot. Yeah. So we can also do it for cross-lingual as in like the, con the context and the target are in different languages. And here we're using like IPA representation. So it probably alleviates some of like the mismatch because like there are shared phonemes across different languages. So this is like, I think Portuguese to French, and this is a prompt. So a terra da promissão. And this is our model. C'est trop de n'avoir pu attirer que votre indifférence. Je ne veux pas y faire succéder la haine en vous importunant plus longtemps de la plus fidèle passion qui fut jamais le duc d'Anjou. And another sample from a female speaker. Cuidado foi se afastando na direção da casa. L'amour fit en lui ce qu'il fait en tous les autres. Il lui donna l'envie de parler. Et après tous les combats qui ont accouté. Okay, so this is like cross-lingo. And just to be clear, like when we train our model, we don't have like this kind of sentences. So each sentence is only in one language. So this is more like emergent. Like when you put together different language, it can still like transfer pretty well. And if you hear, if you heard the sample very, listen to the sample very carefully, you will hear like there's some background noise for this speaker and it's also transferred into the target. So it transferred not only just like the speaker, although like speaker is most noticeable one. And this is my favorite part. So we can also use it for sampling just like a random voice. So you can imagine using this for creating like a new NPC voice for your game or for anything which you don't want to really violate anyone, like reuse anyone's voice. So this is like the sample. Uh, we draw, I think like we sample like 20 or 40 and I handpick like more diverse ones. So like this is not purely six sample out of six, but still very diverse. His conduct and presence of mind in these emergence 
appeared conspicuous. His conduct and presence of mind in this emergence appeared conspicuous. His conduct and presence of mind in this emergence appeared conspicuous. His conduct and presence of mind in the submergence appeared conspicuous. Yeah, so you can hear like there's a lot of like difference both in like prosody, in accents, like in like rhythm, like all oh, those are very different. So after seeing all these samples, like we started asking the question, are our generative models like now good enough to replace like real data for training all the models? So this is what we do. So we have like the liberty speech here, benchmark, where we have like the real audio, like we consider to set up where it's like we train on real data or we train on only synthetic data. And for testing, we always test on real data. So this is like to see if our generated data is super realistic, then like it should be covering the real data distribution good enough. And whatever model trained on this data should also generalize well to even like real data. So on the top two, we have like more like our top lines, like as in like 100 hour of real audio, we see like this performance. So this is not like the best ASR model possible. This is just like some production, like a uh, lightweight ASR model. So just take it for a grain of thought on the epsilon number, but like all these are trained with the same system. So they are comparable. So on the real data, 960 hour of the speech, we see uh, decoding without language model. We see like on test clean data, it's like 2.6 percent water rate on um, test others like 6.3 percent error rate and then you can see like for the previous model if it's like trained on single speaker you can imagine a model trained on single speaker won't generalize well to test on multiple speakers so you see like on an lj speech single speaker vips model the water rate is like 58 and 81 percent on these two sets and on the your tts which is trained on actually like liberty tts data sets but it's just like a I think a flow-based, discrete flow-based model, not as powerful as our model. Uh, it's like better than the first one, but still like 0.5% and 54%, uh, far from this like 2.6 and 6.3 here. So we show actually with our model, um, like let's first look at the bottom one here. So this is, uh, we get to 3.1% water rate and 8.3% like uh, other error rate. And this is only trend on the, Synthetic data That's and how much synthetic data? Uh, yeah, sorry, 960 hour. Yeah. So we synthesize uh, just like the same text as libre speech. So this is more comparable to this line. And also uh, the difference here is like we actually consider two kind of like a duration model. So for duration model, which is like predict the duration for each phony, we use both like the uh, flow matching model or a regression model. So regression model, to be honest, like is still more stable. So it produces like average like duration pattern, but like it's just like more stable. But for a flow matching, you will produce like sometimes uh, on natural speech, like too, like too dramatic, but like it can increase like the variation here. Okay, so finally, like this is the efficient inference. So we showed that like um, the red line here correspond to the runtime for Bali, which is a token-based language model. So we showed that like to generate like 10 seconds of the audio, Bali takes around like uh, seven seconds to generate like this chunk. So we can show that like with our fastest configuration, which is like solving the ordinary differential equation, which is like two steps, we get like 20.4x like speed up. And this is the audio from that. Uh, the This is the voice calling task. The prompt is this one. Thing. And a practical ability is another. And this is only with like two NMV steps. The raft was heaved up on a watery mountain and pitched down again at a distance of 20 fathoms. So if we do the diffusion for more times, then we hear this one. The raft was heaved up on a watery mountain and pitched down again at a distance of 20 fathoms. So you can hear more clearly on our website, but overall, like the more uh, more steps for the OD over would inch would have like a more like higher quality audio and has like less artifacts and also slightly more expressive. But you can still get pretty decent like audio with just like eight uh, diffusion steps. The raft was heaved up on a watery mountain and pitched down again at a distance of 20 fathoms. So overall, it's flexible as in you can just like choose where you want to operate the model on. And in the last slide I have here, uh, we're going to compare flow matching with the optimal transport path versus flow matching with say diffusion path and score matching, which is the conventional diffusion methods, uh, also with the diffusion path. So we see that like our model can train much faster. So the here, 
the X axis is the number of training sets and the Y axis is the speaker similarity when we do this like zero shot TTS. So we see like um, just like 50K updates for the model, we can already get like better performance for most of the configuration here. And on the right, we show like the inference efficiency, which is like the one I showed just now, like this page. So we show like how many uh, OD, sorry, I didn't change the X, the title here. So how many like uh, OD steps you need uh, in order to get good quality audio. So again, we show that with our model, you can get like 0.4 something uh, with only like eight up, uh, eight NFPs. And you get like pretty much saturated, like around like 20 or like 32. And in contrast for score matching or for, for flow matching with diffusion, you see like you typically require many more steps in order to reach like a good level of the like similarity. Okay, so final remark, what's next? So there's a lot to work on here. Um, I know like we definitely want to open source the model, but we haven't open source the model yet because we put like on a website, like it's kind of like text generation, text to speech generation thing, especially you can do zero shot uh, voice cloning can be like dangerous. So there needs to be a way to kind of like either watermark the audio or like reliably detect what are synthetic audio or like what, what's a real audio, right? And try to find a way to implement like a safety measure for that. So I would say like on the top line here, I would put like safe and responsible AI for this line of research is definitely very important. And the second thing is like data curation. So although we want to train on as much data as possible, but still like you will see if we want to say randomly generate like sample and we want it to be mostly like high quality, this is also done for image generation where they also do some data curation, like aesthetic filtering or even human annotation for like say 2000 or 3000 high quality data. So how we can systematically automatically find high quality data would also be important when we want to scale like more than just like 1000 hour or 60,000 hour. And then like better controllability is another thing as in like right now we just like clone everything from the prompt. But can we say just like clone the emotion from prompt A, clone the environment from prompt B, uh, clone the I don't know, voice from prompt C? How can we do have like this disentangled control? Like it's not like soft yet here. And can we also have like a multi-model input like audio and audio visual? Say you want to generate like speech that like is synchronized with the say lip movement or like other modality like bow bouncing if it's like audio generation, that's just like speech. And then uh, generalization to more tasks. Like now it's just like the seven tasks I list just now, but for speech enhancement and source separation, can we just provide like some instruction to the model and ask the model to perform certain tasks? So I think there's still a lot to do research on and I feel like it's a very new area and have a lot of space to work on. So I would like to encourage everyone to start looking into this topic. So uh, yeah, this will be the end of my talk. Time for one question. Two minutes. We waited. Student should ask for a Right, so it's really just like what we do is like we randomly sample like a noise from the prior distribution and generate the audio. So there's nothing we control in advance. Like what we can do is like we draw a ton of like audio and we generate sample and maybe we can select like diverse sample from that. But like there's nothing we can control from the source yet. Yeah. Right, right. Like so like control net or some of the recent work is like you're going to condition on additional information, right? When you train your model, you can say, oh, if I know like this, uh, this audio has like Chinese accents, then I condition on that, right? So how to, but like, it's like, we want to scale, it's not going to be all of the data have like such labels. So it's more like in the regime of like self-supervised or like semi-supervised learning, right? How can we leverage supervision when we have that, yeah. Just 
Yeah, no, I, I think like this is to me more an empirical question. People have shown like Latin space approach, you can learn faster, maybe because like in the Latin space, more, things are more linearly separable or something. So it's easier to map from the input to output. So, but I think it's empirical, just like choose whichever. And Latin things like you also depend on like, again, you are bottlenecked by the Latin feature you use, like how well like the decoder of like that Latin feature can reconstruct the audio. In terms of accountability, like uh, the previous question, you think the Latin approach would be most important if you can like somehow devise I think it's going to be the same. It's not going to solve the controllability problem because like you like the Latin feature or raw feature is just like the output. But what you want to control is like from the input side, what additional input streams you can provide to the model to make the model only draw from a subset of the distribution you're modeling here, like say Indian accents, French accents. Thank you. Yeah, I just have a question on limitations of the process. Implementation. Um, so, if I'm understanding correctly, right, the model, so I have this excerpt of someone's voice, and, someone, mm -hmm. and it's in French, as in speech, yep. and it's able to reproduce that as a voice. So, essentially, um, it can do this for languages that it's seen in training data, for instance, French, but the, the input, whatever language that's in, is that. Yeah, that's a great question. So I suppose the input shouldn't matter. Like we just formulate the model like the, sorry, I think it's this one. So I think like what you're saying is like, uh, we shouldn't care about like the transcript for like the audio context, right? Cause like we will assume what the model inferred from the context is just like the audio style, not the transcript. But just like for simplicity, we always provide just the entire stream. So I think in principle, yes, if we don't condition on the transcript, then it can be even applied to a prompt in announcing language. Yes, an extreme case would be you prompt it with a dog barking and then give it some text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that would be cool, but like I also afraid it's going to be offensive, like whatever accents it generates like in the continuous speech. Like, I mean, I would yeah. like to get a dog saying that thing in French. So that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm only half joking, by the way. I'm serious. I'm no, I, I think it'll be cool. That's out. also what we want to show in when we train the model together. Like, can we generally like download the dog like voice like in zero shot, right? Or like some very animated voice, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you give us some more information about the training data, about the scale and the sources of the data? Yeah, and so. Speakers, if you need to achieve this kind of right, right. So, data, uh, we described in the paper. So, we are, um, for the model I show here, like we train on 60,000 hours of audiobooks uh, for the English, for the, we have like English model and multilingual model. The English model is just like the data everyone knows, which is like 60,000 hours. And we still label that to create the transcript. Uh, for the multilingual data, it's like also the audiobook data set. And it has like, uh, I think six, we use only six languages out of the entire like eight languages, uh, just because we're using Montreal Force Aligner. So I think like some languages like uh, Italian and uh, I forgot the other one wasn't like supported there. So uh, in terms of number of speakers, I think for the, uh, the audiobook, it's about, 7,000 ish. Yeah. But we also had ablation study in the appendix, which uses like 960 hour of data. So it's like 2000 speaker ish. Yeah. We definitely see.